Hello, everybody. Welcome to UGA Sports Live. My name is Roddy Nabulsi. I'm joined by Dane Young and Jim Donnan. Jim Donnan, of course, is the former Georgia Bulldogs head coach and a fantastic guy to grab dinner with. Just let you know. It's happened once or twice, and uh, he, he is a good dinner uh, conversationalist. He's very engaging, and he, uh, <laughs> it's a lot of fun. Uh, we appreciate all of you joining us after your dinner hour or if you're having dinner right now on a Thursday at 8 o'clock, so be it. Uh, we had to move our show from Tuesday at noon because – some guy named Kirby Smart decided he wanted to have a press conference right at noon, so we didn't want to go up against him, and we also wanted to be there for it. So we appreciate all of our normal Tuesday viewers who are joining us this Thursday. We'll probably have to do the same thing next week because I think Kirby will probably speak at noon again next Tuesday. Maybe we'll do it Tuesday evening. Either way, just stay tuned to all of our uh, social media channels, and we will let you know when the show will be next week. Uh, speaking of Kirby Smart, uh, he led us into practice the other day, and – Coach, I want to ask you a few questions about some of the stuff we saw. Now, granted, we only saw 15 minutes, and we didn't see one-on-ones and stuff like that, but a few things caught my eye. And when I spoke to Jed May after practice, he had watched the defense the first day and uh, then the offense the second day. We both had the same thoughts about some of the uh, transfers that have come in and some of the guys that are currently there. But Colby Young, big, big wide receiver out of uh, Miami, that is a big guy. He's huge. Yeah, I think just naturally when you got a guy that size that can run like that and had – I thought Dane uh, had some good stuff on him on, on the show with Brent about, uh, you know, what he brings to the table as far as scoring touchdowns and making things happen. But, uh, you know, the, the general tendency, and it's been that way every place I've ever coached or every fan base, is you have a little bit more juice about guys that you don't know about than the ones you got. And uh, certainly these guys deserve a lot of plaudits or uh, encouragement and everything. But I'm really encouraged with the guys we have and the first line guys. And I feel like Arian Smith might make a big move here just because of the change. Uh, You know, the fact that he has a new lease on life with another coach, even though, you know, he did a good job with BMAC. But I think Coach Coley has some different ideas that might – really trend in towards his skill set and uh, a real good technician uh, in uh, Coley does a lot of good drills that uh, I've always liked that, uh, you know, you just can't say catch the ball and do that. I mean, that's pretty obvious, but you need to know where your depth perception affects uh, your different placement of your hands. You need to know how to, where the ball's coming from. So your head's in the right direction. You don't have to adjust to it. As you make your break, you know, anticipate where the ball's coming from. And, you know, like we've said, when the ball's deep, run on the balls of your feet, uh, back on your heels more so your head doesn't bob when you catch the ball as compared with if you're up on the balls or toes, your head's bobbing up and down. You want a steady influence that. Just little things like that that I think Arian will definitely uh, improve on. And, uh, of course, getting raw raw back will help, and we know what, everything that, that we got with love it. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think the two other guys will help us too. And then freshman wise, uh, certainly last year, Evans really got my attention, particularly yeah. in the, uh, I think these other guys will help us too, but I don't want to get the cart for the horse here and talk about receivers all the time. But the one thing that's very evident for you and Dane that, that had a chance to watch them and for me watching them, the little bit that I did today because I knew we had a show and I wanted to see some of the high school coaches that were here and they're stacked up like cordwood around there. They're not supposed to be here really until tonight, but some of them played hooky, I think, and left a little early from school and they were three or four deep around the, the field. Kirby said there were seven to 800 coaches coming this weekend. Yeah. Well, I would say that's an underestimation uh, based on what I saw out there today. Uh, the only thing that I, I would say to a coach, don't bring your five or six year old son to, to the thing because, you know, I mean, sure, that's nice, but this is for the coaches. And, you, you know, it's hard for those kids to hear everything's going on out there and stuff like that. So I'd say in the future, just become yourself. Uh, I think, too, uh, tremendous organization by the staff here. When you look at all you got to do setting up the indoor facility, like tonight, they'll have these chalk talks where they'll have little corners of the of the different parts of the building there and the defensive backs will be there and uh, the coaches will be talking to them about what they want to ask them and then 
quarterbacks. They're all around there. But I always like that from a staff perspective. So the assistant coaches that were on my staff could really kind of go front and center in front of these high school coaches and see what kind of really good teachers they were besides just being good recruiters and coaches and all. But when you get on the board like that and you have to uh, break it down to a high school level, it really gets you – and, of course, these high school coaches are certainly good enough to be college, but, you know, just really some basic stuff there. And it lets them get to know them a little better. And then, you know, also you, you have areas that maybe – some of these guys recruit. We've got new coaches here having those areas, and it gives them a chance to meet them on a really social issue as compared to being in their school for the first time. So when, uh, you know, say Dante Williams goes out to a school in the spring, he's had this guy here for camp, uh, this this practice here, and he's already met him or, or whoever it might be. Yeah. So it, it's just a, a good way of showing the coaches – how much you count on them, and uh, it, it's a lifeblood of your program, the, the feeder system, and it's certainly University of Georgia. Very, very fortunate to have the, the uh, schools in our state and the contiguous states. When you look at Tennessee, uh, South Carolina, Alabama, uh, Florida, all those states, a lot of those guys come in for this too. Uh, well, you were you, you got sidetracked talking about how great the coaching clinic is, but you, before that, you were saying you saw some stuff at practice in the two minutes you were out there about the wide receivers. Yeah, I mean, I saw a little bit about everything. I mean, I like the way it, I like to watch them flex. I like to go out there and watch these guys stretch and see how limber they are. You know, there's a lot you can tell about a guy when he's warming up. Uh, and we got some pretty flexible guys, and you've got some big guys, some really big, humongous linemen. Offensive lineman Daniel Calhoun. I've talked about him before, but uh, just the overall uh, size and ability and skill level to go with the speed that we have is pretty evident. And you just got to put all that and mold it together, which I'm sure they would. But the one thing that overriding about everything was the the, the discipline that our team has out there to, to only being out there. Uh, for this is their, I think their fifth practice and to, to be able to run the different coverages they're running, to be able to run the different offensive uh, attacks and formations and not have a lot of mental errors, a lot of sloppy stuff, a lot of penalty stuff like that. At this point, very encouraging for me as an old ball coach, because I can usually see after 50 some years watching, uh, you know, about where a team is and where it's going. And I think this team right now is right where you want it to be, but it's got a long way to go to teach everything, but they really are uh, in sync with each other. Coach, you said in any place you've been, there's a novelty with new receivers that come in and fans get excited about that. And in a lot of cases they should, but there is a tradition here, Roddy, of the big tall wide receivers that Georgia fans and really any team that I've ever covered fans really get excited about the potential of those guys. And sometimes it's a Matt Landers, it's a Jonathan Rumpf, and they become dog vent legends and they contribute in different ways. But every now and again at Georgia, you do get one of these tall wide receivers that can make a big difference, especially yeah. down in the red zone. To, to your point, he just kind of stood out because now Tyler Williams is a big boy too. You know, yeah, I, I think you're right. You're right for sure. And he's a red zone nightmare for anybody, just like uh, Bell is. I mean, uh, Bell continues to look good and, the other thing is that I always measure in the passing game is how many times the ball on the ground. I mean, uh, it's easy to throw the ball back and forth, you know, without any coverage and easy to throw warming up and all. But when a guy, even if it, nobody's covering you, you can throw a bad pass or a guy can drop it, but not many uh, drop balls and not many uh, errant throws out there from the top three quarterbacks. Yeah, you were uh, talking about Arian Smith, and you kind of jumped ahead on me because I was going to ask you about him in the few minutes we were out there. They were running uh, per, uh, some uh, drill on the perimeter, and he went and stuck his face mask in Dylan Everett's uh, breastbone, just tagged him. And I'm like, that's Arian Smith? So he looks good. But, Coach, I, I, I want to – there is the novelty of the new guys. And I asked Kirby about it the – First scrim, our first press conference we had. I said, "What do you? What can you tell me about your three new wide receivers?" He says, "Nothing." 
there. I've seen him in shorts. I've seen him working out. Uh, let's let's get him in practice. So we asked again this past week, and he goes, "Yeah, this guy's been had a little foot issue, and these other guys are going to help us." You know, and he told he had a good we had a good story yesterday. Thanks to Kirby, kind of giving us an idea what the new guys do, and that's part of the spring is you know who are the new faces and who are the older faces have developed. And remember, it's only been three months since the, they played their last game. You know, yet well, not even that two and a half months. So it's not like there's a huge difference, but yeah, we should be talking about new squad. I mean, and Dylan Bell, uh, Dominic Lovett, uh, Arian Smith, those, those guys, three wide, four wide, uh, Oscar Delt, your returning guys look great. Yeah. We should be talking about the masters right now, but we're talking about college football. I mean, you know, it's just uh, – it's front and center all the time around here, 24-7, which I like. I think it's great. But uh, – and and certainly we've mentioned this before, but I'm going to make it very cl- clear again. The fact that so many of these freshmen that are going to be called on are already here and yeah. don't have to wait till the summer to start doing their job. Uh, Riddell, I think, right now has a little hamstring issue or something. He's not going full boat, but – uh, he certainly got some good speed to go out there tight in, and uh, and certainly Heinrich's got some size too. But Lucky continues to look good to me. Uh, just the potential was there. I know last year he got hurt, but you know, very fluid athlete that'll really help. Help, I think, as far as the thing. And we got the tight end coming in from Stanford too, which will be good. But you know, Arian Smith, to your point. He he's got to be pretty tough for Kirby to use him as a gunner on the punt team. True, you know the fact that he'll go down there and make a lick and get off of press coverage and make a tackle. I mean, he's been good at that for several years. Yeah, it was good to see him going. Uh, I won't say with the ones we just saw his re- his rep, and I'm like, that's a guy. We've all been waiting for that shooter drop, and I think that it might now. Uh, Speaking of another, and again, I'm, I'm fascinated with the new guys because we feel like we know some of the older ones. Going back to what Kirby Smart said last week, uh, he said, look, I've got 30 to 40 guys I know can play championship football. I'm trying to find the next 30 to 40. So in our two viewing periods, we've been focusing on maybe that next 30 to 40. You mentioned the uh, uh, the big offensive linemen that are in. He said Nair Daniels came in at 396 pounds. He's dropped 40 to 50 pounds, so now he's only 350. He's six foot eight. You mentioned Calhoun, uh, uh, Uni. There's a, a bunch of new offensive linemen, five new guys. And Kirby says, you know, hey, we're, we're, we're throwing them in the fire. We're, we're working them out. I want to talk, though, about a new running back. George's got a pretty loaded running back room. And Rod Robinson, the guy that's coming back, he looks fantastic. But when I was out there looking and looking for number one, because I know that uh, Trevor Etienne is supposed to be wearing number one, the guy that I saw up there was this little running back. And I'm like, Man, is that the right number? I didn't realize he's only like five nine, five ten. He's he not. Does. He looks a little shorter too. Besides Robinson and those guys, and I think uh, certainly he comes in kind of a dynamo back. He's got way to split the coverage, catching the ball, and and really hits it hard on the uh, inside zone. And he just got good tape. You look at him with that Florida offensive line. Can you imagine what he's going to do with ours? So. Uh, I'm fired up about him, and then certainly uh, Andrew Paul and Robinson should be Always. good. And you, you never know how it's going to work out, but uh, definitely the one thing that that's clear to me too is when you see some of these times, which I can't really talk about on here because it wouldn't be fair because I see him. Right. But uh, when some of your freshmen, you're talking about, he's looking for the next thirty or forty. When some of your freshmen have the best GPS of their group. That's encouraging. Well, I had heard that this team, I asked somebody who goes to practice or who's at least been to one, said, what, what do you think of? And they're like, this, this team's fast. They're, they're light on their feet. I'm like, well, they're, it's kind of surprised me because of all the size they brought in. Uh, well, and to be fair on ETN too, Roddy, if any of the three of us stood beside Roger Robertson or Branson Robinson, we're gonna look a little small too. I know, but see, I didn't realize that. I'm thinking SEC back. He doesn't. He does five eleven, two hundred five pounds, right? Give you credit. He doesn't. That's the first thing you think about. He doesn't look very tall. He doesn't. For sure. And I give you credit being able to see that. You can really pick him out, Roddy. 
<laughs> hey, James hey. Cook wasn't very tall either, and that's working no, out. No, he, yeah, he, that's he can be DeAndre Swift. You don't have to be big. I was just thinking it was uh, – I was giving compliments to Colby Young being the new guy and being you know standing out. Yeah, I would say that's the only thing that would be when you look at him, he's a physical, really looks good everywhere, but he's not real tall, that's for sure. But no, and you don't have to be. Uh, DeAndre Swift proved that. Uh, but I thought it was interesting that he, he's repping number one, no, no thing there. But Kirby Smart in his press conference said he's already a leader on this team. I'm like, the guy hadn't been here two and a half months. And for Kirby Smart to give him the nod as giving good leadership in that room, I'm like, oh, and we'd heard that about his family. We'd heard about the ETNs, They're just great people, great support family, uh, fit right in. We, we we met some people who had worked with the family with his older brother, and it was a Georgia guy. He's like, I couldn't be happier that he's coming to Georgia. I hated that he was in Florida because I love the kid, and he's going to be here now. I can root doubly for him because he was rooting for him at Florida, and now he's rooting for him at Georgia. And he says, this kid's great. And that's all we heard from all the other players, too, was how well Trevor Etienne was fitting in. Who yeah, I don't think you can bring a guy in with his background and not start him out as number one. I mean, that's yeah. – because these other guys haven't played. The only guy that's really played is is, uh, is uh, Jones, and he certainly is a good player. But, uh, you know, I think you're going to go with uh, – it's like last spring. I mean, they had Dominic Lovett up there right off the bat, and Ra Ra. I mean, you got you only got 15 days. You can't go out there, and it's not like Albert Einstein out there experimenting every day. Who do you think Travis Etienne will be pulling for in that first game, Clemson and Georgia? Ooh. I hope he's he's pulling for his brother, but he wants to pull for the team that's going to win. He needs to pull for his brother. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming he'll be there. I mean, that's before the NFL season starts. He yeah, won't probably. play much in preseason, so probably will. Probably he'll probably will probably be in the building. Hey, Coach, uh, I want to get your thoughts on Jared Wilson. We got to speak with him for the first time in a media situation. Of course, we had interviewed him as a uh, recruit. Been in Georgia a while. Replacing Cedric Van Pran is a monumental task. One of the top Georgia centers I've covered in my career, guy that's ever well-loved, uh, very good at his job, started so many games for Georgia. And you've got returning guys at left tackle, right tackle, left guard, right guard, but you're replacing the center. And you always tell me the center quarterback exchange is the most important part of every play. It's, it can all go yeah. to hell. No, but no. everyone's talking about what a freak – athletically, your center is Jared Wilson. Talking about how fast he is and some of the GPS numbers. Kirby Smart said that he's actually put up some numbers that put him ahead of a tight end or two, maybe even a defensive back or two. And I'm like, he wouldn't name names, but that is nuts that that center can move that fast. Yeah, I know that I'm talking to Coach Searles over the last couple of years. You know, he says just – he says, great that you got Van Pran, but it's tough that you can't put this guy in there more because he really is a starter type. So, uh, you know, as uh, we can't say enough about how steady Van Pran was and never mm -hmm. made maybe one bad snap in his career, I, I think. And that's because the count was different or something and the quarterback wasn't looking. But I just feel like uh, watching this guy, and I took a little more interest in high school-wise because he is from North Carolina. and uh, they were able to uh, bring him in here from, uh, I think he's from around the Winston-Salem area. And, and I know all those North Carolina schools were just sick that they, they lost him, but he, he really has, I mean, when you think about the footwork and it has to be incorporated in offensive linemen and you add the fact that you've got to snap the ball and then move your feet as compared to just getting in a stance and coming off the ball. It takes a, a good athlete to be able to do that. And when you got the quickness to uh, block back when a guard, say the left guard's pulling and you got to feel for him when the guard pulls, that first step is great because if you allow penetration, that guy can knock the guard off or he can maybe, you know, get back in there and, and stop the counter or the, or the power play. And then your ability in a zone scheme what we say snatch and by that i mean you're just going to take that quick first step and snatch a one technique that's lined up in your guard center gap there uh just it really takes more quickness than it does strength because if you can get there and get position then it's, it's at least a tie right and then after that that's all you want but if you can get movement on top of it but 
But this guy, he's as close to, you know, filling the bill there at center as we could have at this point, in my opinion. I thought it was hilarious that uh, Tate Radledge said, look, yeah, they've had me take a few snaps because they cross-trained people and guys get injured. We saw that last year. I mean, to me, that's the reason Georgia doesn't have a national championship, you know, just injuries. Uh, <laughs> Tate Radledge like, yeah, after I snapped a few balls, I called Cedric Van Brand and go, man, I have a newfound respect for what you did all those years. So it's a, uh, it, it is a high – you get all the blame and none of the credit when you work at center. It's a tough job. And I thought Tate Rattledge giving uh, Cedric Van Pran props was uh, very, very nice there. Uh, you mentioned North Carolina coach. We also got to speak with Jalen Walker, the inside linebacker, outside linebacker. Should be the student president, you know, student body president. Uh, again, one of the top recruits to come out of North Carolina. I know everybody up there hates that he couldn't, couldn't uh, they couldn't keep him. But I, we, he was asked, and I want to get your take on this, is it a blessing or a curse to have to be cross-trained at both positions? In other words, if you're spending so much time working at you know both spots, or is it keeping you from being exceptional at one spot? I don't know what he answered, but in my opinion, to be able to do that mentally has got to be really unreal and then physically have that kind of skill to play inside and out is uh, another good uh, – you know, the, the whole deal is they just want him to get on the field. we got good players at both those positions, and, you know, I think he's shown his ability in the uh, Jaguar park package when he comes in on third down and lines up as a rush in. How, how good he can rush the passer, but this guy can play the pass in the air. He was a tight end in high school. He's a coach's son. He's a coach on the field. And as you mentioned, uh, just very articulate. I think he's a student rep now for the uh, athletic council that the University of Georgia has, athletic board. He's just a special young man, and we got a lot of them, but I think he can really have a big year for us. He does play some outside linebacker, and we've seen um, Georgia brought in three really good kind of uh, edge guys last year in, uh, in Pimba, Gabe Harris, uh, Damon Wilson. Give me your thoughts real quick on some of those guys because Chad Shambles needs somebody on the other side of him. I tell you, Damon Wilson makes my mouth water. I mean, really good. Just explosive, good feet, good hands, can get off blocks. Uh, and Pimba was really kind of a just learning the position, but starting to get a lot more comfortable there. And then, of course, Gabe Harris has really good potential. And uh, all three – or the kind of guys, if you had to say, hey, could I, should I recruit this guy again? Every one of them, you'd say, yeah, I'd like to have about two or three of them. I did hear Gabe Harris in that uh, they were doing a pursuit drill where the defense lines up, they throw it to a wide receiver, he runs down the edge of the uh, sideline, and they make sure that everybody runs that receiver down. Doesn't that's Not just the secondary, not just the safeties. It's not just K.J. Mould and the new guy or – you know, Malachi Starks, they want every body, all 11 guys to run him down on the edge. Zero techniques to nine techniques. Everybody on the far side, everybody go after him. And Kirby Smart's sitting there with a GPS assigning loafs for anybody who's not running fast enough. They test them and they track how fast they're running. So you have to run down the sideline there. And the only guy I heard that got a good compliment was Gabe Harris. So yeah, <laughs> I think well, that was a compliment in 15 minutes. If he gets a compliment from him, you better take that one and write it down because he doesn't give them out unless he means them. And that's good. <laughs> Today was a good day. <laughs> it teaches team pursuit. That's what you want to do. I mean, yeah. we don't have pads on and like they do now, but there's only so much you can do in practice. So you can teach things like that, team pursuit, practice recovering fumbles, practice, uh, you know, a lot of different things that, that aren't quite as – they don't require to have pads on, and uh, they do a good job of taking advantage every minute out there. All right, before we get the commercial break, and we've got a lot more stuff to talk about spring when we come back from that, but I thought the, my, the one of the funniest lines was he got onto one of the freshman defensive backs, or excuse me, defensive linemen, and he said, oh, that, 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 that's a loaf. That's a loaf. You weren't going fast enough. You weren't giving it your all. And he says, you can't argue with the GPS. You can't argue with the science. Gravity is real. And 
and I had to keep from la- busting out laughing. <laughs> it's like, it's like, gravity, yes. Gravity's real. That's a good yeah. one. Gravity's real. That's not something I've ever heard in a football practice before, but he's right. He's, that guy was fighting gravity. He's uh, some some of those guys uh, having to learn how hard how hard Georgia practices are. I mean, they're rough. That's one thing old Bear Brown said. I'll tell you one thing, son. Gravity is real. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, if you're if you're 330 pounds, it, it, it feels different than if you're 165. Uh, speaking of real, if you have a chance, I want you to spring, uh, run out to our friends at Academy Brewing Company, and you will get the most real, the most wonderful food that you will find in Athens. They have fantastic uh, menu items out there. It's a great place to have as a restaurant. Now, it is Academia Brewing Company, and they are always making new beers. So if you get a chance... Go out there and try some of the new beers. There's always some great stuff out there. They're finally getting more and more restaurants. They're finding these folks are realizing that, hey, when people come in, they want a local beer. And the IQ IPA or the Noctua or any, any of the others that they buy from uh, 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 Academia sell out. People love them. So you're seeing a lot more uh, Academia Brewing Company cans in your local grocery stores, in your gas stations, wherever you buy beer, you're seeing them there. You're also seeing a lot more of them on draft in restaurants. Now, of course, there's always some fun stuff going on out there. Like right now, they're going to have the um, Athens Cars and Coffee. They'll be out there in uh, on April 6th at 10 a.m. Again, a lot of great car shows going on in Academia Brewing Company. A lot of great trivia nights. There's always uh, live music out there. So check out Academia Brewing Company when you get the chance. While you're on that side of town, Swing by Athens Ford. They have 762 vehicles on the lot. That, that's saying something. They've got tons of new ones, tons of used ones. But the overriding thing you get when you go out there, and everyone says they have great customer service. I challenge you, go on to the Rate My Dealer app or Rate My Dealer website. Type in Athens Ford. See what it says about the, the, the people's experiences when they go buy a car at Athens Ford. You can see a lot of five-star ratings because you have a great experience. So I won't even say that the best thing they have is customer service because people that's going to go one ear and out the other. What is the benefit to you by going to Athens Ford? Well, A, you support the university, but most of you buy season tickets anyway and you give big donations. I get it. But when you buy a vehicle from Athens Ford, you're going to get a lifetime powertrain warranty on it. That's not something you get at every Ford dealership. There's big name Ford dealerships. You've heard about them for a long time. Athens Ford's been around 10, 11 years now. There's some that have been around 30, 40 years, and you know those names, but they do not offer the lifetime powertrain warranty. So you have to get that at Athens Ford. So that's why you need to go out there and get your next vehicle. We'll get to more spring football in just a minute, but I do want to quickly acknowledge postseason college basketball, Georgia winning a postseason game, and they're going to play Wake Forest on Sunday, still in the NIT. But, Coach, you're from North Carolina. I know this college basketball tournament is ingrained in your blood. It has to be. Uh, it's one thing that was – the stat that was craziest to me, the state of Alabama had four teams in the NCAA tournament on the men's side. The state of Georgia had zero. So it's just crazy how you can build a team in six months and it doesn't have to be at a big school anymore. Yeah, hey, that was a big ACC tournament win for NC State beating Carolina in the finals, especially having to win five straight days. But – uh I think it's going to be hard for them to go very far in the tournament. Hopefully, he can. Then North Carolina won today against Wagner. Where is Wagner? Uh, <laughs> I don't even know, but I will find out for you. Is that, uh, Robert Wagner or what? Is, I don't know. Colorado? It's probably it's New Jersey. Uh, ah, yeah, that's probably it. I see a Wagner College in New York. Okay. New York's close enough. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That counts. <laughs> But, uh, you know, hey, uh, count I, it. You know, the thing about it, which I liked about Coach White uh, stating, you know, hey, it's one more chance for us to play as a team. Our guys want to play, get a chance to keep coaching them. And uh, that's what you want. Uh, you know, like some people say, well, you know, why are you playing a bowl game? And what's it? But, hey, th- these kids work hard and it's a reward to keep playing. Yeah. So I, I was glad to see that. It showed a lot of, uh, to me, a lot of, uh, at least, even though we didn't have the kind of year that we hoped, uh, we got some good freshmen. Hopefully we can keep them and got some guys coming in. But uh, I went to the game the other night, and I was afraid they're down the end. I mean, we were, we were <laughs> holding on. But the reality is 
uh, one more game. We've already beaten Wake once this year. Maybe we can do it again. And SEC has a rough a rough start in the tournament. The, the South Carolina's already out. Mississippi State's already out. Kentucky's down at halftime as we're recording this to Oakland. I expect they'll come back and win that. But you never know about UK in the tournament. I mean, they're Doctor J. How, how far down are they? It was three points, but still halftime. They're playing Oakland, eh? Oakland. Yeah. Uh, and to your point, a lot of people are like, well. I remember tweeting out, hey, Georgia is playing in the NIT. And a lot of people say, who cares? I'm like, there's 15 kids that care. There's a staff that cares. And if you if you want your coach to be better, you take advantage of every opportunity. And those freshmen, every every game they get is a, you know, a right. chance for them to be better. So if you want Blue Cane to do more, give him hey, at least one more game and all the practices that lead up to that and give him you know, I agree. Like, I agree. two games. So I'm all about it. Anyway. Uh, Coach, real quick, give me your thoughts on Jamal Jarrett. This guy was – he was Kirby Smart's whipping boy last year when we would uh, go out to practice. Kirby would be a big job, always – I'm not ripping him, but chiding him to move faster, move bigger. Yeah, I mean, just – He just looks good. He looks great. He's lost some weight. He looks – I wouldn't say he's felt yet, but no. he's pretty good compared to where he was. And he's got some uh, – good quickness and pop to him and he just needs to have a little success out there. And uh, he, he's going to do better 11 on 11 maybe than he does one on one. You know what I mean? But yeah, you know, maybe somebody might handle him, but he, he can, he's a space eater. You know, he, he, he eats up a lot of space with his big butt in his area. Uh, and he just uh, helps your linebackers, you know, open up and uh, uh, we've got, I don't know how they're going to decide on all these linebackers because we 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 definitely got some guys back there that can run and hit and know what they're doing. And uh, I mean, you got an all conference preseason all conference linebacker that leaves here because he can't get on the field. Dumas Johnson. So I mean, pretty impressive. Yeah, it was a very young inside linebacker group. So he was at Kirby Smart was asked about them. He's like, yeah, you had. We have two of our guys, you know, Raylan Wilson, C.J. Allen, who were forced to play earlier due to injuries than we would have wanted them to. Usually about this time, they're just now getting their playing time, but those guys are vets now. And you saw how big C.J. Allen played last year. Raylan Wilson was tearing it up. And then uh, you got uh, uh, Boyles. Uh, Bowles. Bowles, excuse me. Uh, and all these just now kind of coming into it. And then you signed the number one inside linebacker in the nation. That room, it, it almost starts to feel like when you had the three inside linebackers drafted. Well, the other thing you got is the probably, if not the best athlete on the team, top three in Smile Munden, who's yeah. coming off a little surgery situation. And he, he's out there helping them. We talked about that last week, coaching them up and everything. But he will be, he will be really good next year with all the experience he has and all the supporting cast around him in the secondary. I mean, I, I can project a, a awesome year for him. I mean, there's a couple guys on this team that would be drafted in next month's NFL draft, but they came back to Georgia for a variety of reasons. I think Munden can improve his stock if he stays healthy this year. But between him, we know Carson Beck would have made a lot of money. I know he makes a lot of money at Georgia, but you look around the team, there's multiple NFL guys that would have been drafted next month. Yeah, Rattledge, Truss, I mean, for sure. Yeah. But you look at that that one thing we I think Dane or Roddy said about it a couple of weeks ago. Number one linebacker, number one corner in Robinson, number one safety in Bolden. Those are three guys there that are in the top ten in the country on defense, all here right now as freshmen reporting. Pretty impressive. And then uh, you got you signed five defensive linemen. You signed six offensive linemen. You signed three running backs, one of which is here, Chancey Bowen. Again, he also makes <laughs> he makes Trevor A.T. look a little bit smaller, too. He's a big old boy. He's big. Uh, he can run. I watch him. He got good change of direction, and uh, his confidence level has really progressed here in less than the two months he's been here because he knows what he's doing. You know, it's easier to play running back probably early as anything because, you know, except for picking up the pass protection, it's pretty pretty much like you always do anywhere. Hey, run the ball through the four hole or number eight or nine wide, whatever it might be. But 
he he got some skill now. Uh, and we got two backs that Florida wanted, one that they had, and they lost, and we got one that had committed and came here. So that makes it even better. Yeah. Uh, let's talk real quick about the schedule. You mentioned Florida, and that makes me think about <laughs> the poor bastards of Florida. They already had one of the toughest schedules in the nation, and you – the news broke yesterday, or the news was regurgitated yesterday, that the 2025 schedule would basically be the reverse of the 2024 schedule. And everybody started tweeting it and talking about it, and I'm like, we've known this. Coach John had told us this. And I'm like, I didn't remember when, but I, I felt like I've known this for forever. And you mentioned it, and so that makes me think of Florida, because every, everybody in Florida is complaining about the ridiculous schedule they have. Well, now they get it in reverse next year. But the good news for Georgia is we we're talking about Georgia's schedule being a lot tougher this year with away games at Ole Miss, Texas, and Alabama. Uh, next and year's home and schedule and Kentucky. And, yeah, yeah. And Kentucky. but I think the thing about Florida that this it, it makes it even harder is some of their non-conference games are playing on top of the conference. I mean, they're playing Miami, Florida State, and one other really good team. Uh, I wouldn't say Miami's a good team yet. Maybe they will be, but. Who's that third one they're playing? Uh, somebody. But, you know, when we were first projecting this, Dane uh, asked me about it, and I checked around with some of the the so-called people that are in the know, and, you know, the, the general tendency was going to be, hey, there's going to be eight or nine games. And uh, finally they decided on eight because they really didn't know whether the playoff was going to expand. You know, right. we weren't sure if there were going to be more or less. And, you're trying to look at the playoff in your future scheduling because you want to get as many teams as you can. And you're kind of defeating yourself if you play nine in the SEC as compared to eight when you want to get three or four teams in there. So uh, they went with a more routine deal of eight. And when they did that, they pretty much said, look, we'll have to do it for two years just to make it fair where they could team can play home and home. And, I still don't think it's fair for us to have to play Alabama two straight times there. We played them in the COVID year there, and now we're playing them the first game here. Uh, I mean, the second game we play Kentucky first, but but who knows what's fair or not. But anybody uh, that says our schedule next year is not as tough as Florida is smoking some weed, man. We got some tough games now. I can tell you're heartbroken for Florida, though. I can hear it. Oh, yeah, I'm worried about the. I'm worried about them, but not as much as Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State's worrying me really badly. <laughs> Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State keeps catching stray bullets from Coach Tom. Hey, well, Coach. Really, well, you know, is Oklahoma State's best pitcher in base in softball went to the transfer portal and went to OU. I mean, you talk about some people really chapped. You know, OU won three straight national championships. And now the best player on Oklahoma State's team decides, hey, I'm tired of this. I've got my fifth year. I'm going to OU, too. So that made it even better. Did you see the Sooner Schooner up on campus uh, in Athens the other day? Did you hear about that, Coach? Had the Sooner Schooner here? Yeah, there must be. I'll give him credit. I saw Mike Griffith tweeted that. I think he was walking out and saw it. Lost or what? No, apparently, I guess Oklahoma and Texas are both doing it, going around to campuses in the SEC. And in the world they get that Conestoga wagon over here. It was it was on North Campus by the fountain. Well, I, should, I would like to go on over there and get my picture made with it. <laughs> I tell you what, old Switzer used to say, "Let's let's run those horses where they really get thirsty." And but that man, is every time we scored, they had to run around the field. So <laughs> he liked for those horses to be thirsty. <laughs> nah, I, I love it. I love it. Hey, Coach, quickly, um, I know that when I talk to our fans, they say Coach Don just tells such great stories. So spring football, are there any stories that come to your mind from your coaching career that just stand out among the rest? Oh, you got plenty of them, but the one that my first year as head coach, uh, we're getting ready for our first scrimmage, and we're having a an illegal walkthrough on the day before, which – you know, we weren't supposed to be out there, but I was wanted to make sure that everybody knew what to do. So we were out there. We weren't. We didn't have a ball or anything uh, at first. But then at the end, we were going to practice the special teams, and we we're practicing. Excuse me, right in the middle, we we're going to practice uh, field goals and extra points. 
And I told this, uh, everybody, I said, this is half speed. Don't come in here. I don't want you running into the kicker. Nothing like that. Well, the first rattle out of the box, this corner comes off the edge, 90 miles an hour, blocks the kick and knocks the kicker back. And I'm going completely nuts. I mean, I'm not swearing at him or anything. And I'm trying to decide what to do with it. And I said, we were practicing in the old Fairfield Stadium because our stadium wasn't built yet. And we were in the process. And I said, just, just get up here to the press box. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so he went, he went up to the press box and uh, I didn't, so we, so then we're going about an hour later, we're going through the substitution and going through everything. And I said, when we went through the first team defense and then the second team and, and this one corner wasn't there, I said, where's Wilson? And uh, Mickey Matthews came over and said, coach, he's still up in the press. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, you keep the reprobates who screw up. You send them to the press box. Tell them to get his ass down here, you know. But that was my discipline. I didn't know what I was so stupid. I said, just get them to the press box. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> when I got to Oklahoma, we had this uh, crusty old equipment man that was a baseball coach and then he retired. And uh, so he needed a job. So they put him in charge of the equipment. And he acted like everything there was his own. I mean, you had to, for you to get a new jock or new socks, or I mean, it had to be an act of Congress. I mean, he, he guys wouldn't even go up to talk to him. So, you know, we're I got Troy Aikman and some of these guys, and we're we're, we're trying to get the passing game going. And I looked at these balls, and they looked like balls that Bud Wilkinson had used back in 1957. I mean, <laughs> they were terrible. And uh, I told the equipment man, I said, hey, we need to get some new balls. He said, well, Jack won't let you use any balls except uh, uh, after the season starts and we use the game balls for practice. I said, what? I don't know how I said it. I said, I want some. I want a new ball out here. We got, we're going to throw new balls in practice. That's what we play. And he said, uh, he said, I'll go ask him. I said, what do you mean? I'm the offensive coordinator. I'm telling him I want some balls. <laughs> well, then – Jack walks out there and he's in front of me. He said, what's the deal here? He said, we don't use new balls around here. I said, this is Oklahoma. Uh, why wouldn't we use them? He said, well, we just never have. We always save them to the, for the season. And I said, well, how are we going to? So I went over to Switzer. I said, coach, I said, I don't know what I got to do. I said, I'll buy the balls. I said, we're going to throw new balls out here, whether he gets them to us or not. He said, boy, he said, you got a lot of guts talking to Jack. <laughs> 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 you got guts asking Jack. I said, "Well, I'm trying to throw." It. So, so reluctantly, Switzer went over and told him to give us two balls. So we had two brand new balls that lasted the whole spring. But then after that, you know, he realized that we weren't running the wishbone and all that. We needed some new balls. But I never will forget Switzer saying, "I had a lot of guts asking the equipment man for a new ball." How? The, I'm just saying. Barry Switzer, I'm not intimidated, but <laughs> what kind of man does it take to intimidate Barry Switzer? Yeah. That's what you're saying. Jack was a crusty old man. Now he was good. I mean, he's good as gold once you got to know him, but it was like uh I mean the player, I mean, that's one thing I've always talked to our players about about the equipment, man. You know, it shouldn't be like an act of Congress to get something, you know. Hey, if you need something, you need it, but don't don't uh you know, take advantage of it and, and turn your gear in on time and all that stuff. But uh, there's certainly a lot of other stories about the spring and everything. And uh, uh, hey, well, speaking of stories, the first, coach, first uh, story I had here at Georgia wasn't in the spring, but it was that we played Tennessee the first year and Peyton Manning was there and we were trying to get all our coverages and it was raining. And we couldn't practice on Tuesday, and uh, so we had to go over to the Ramsey Center, and we couldn't get in there because we <laughs> had all these different kind of things going on and uh, for intramurals and all. And they finally let us in there for a half hour, and then they said, well, if you schedule it tomorrow, you know, if it rains again, we'll put you over here for an hour or so. And I said, well, that's nice of you. you know. So it rains the next day, and we're over there, and then Joe Tereshinsky calls me and says, hey, Coach. He says, stop raining. I said, good, go get the buses. We'll go back and practice on artificial turf. So we get back out there, and the damn band's out there practicing. Oh. <laughs> and uh, and uh, I say, look, y'all got to get off. We got to get ready. We didn't get to go outside yesterday or today. And they said, well, we got it reserved. I said, 
what do you mean you got to reserve? This is a football team. We got to have this field right now. And they said, well, we got a lot of people here that can't come back. I said, well, go down there on the grass field. I said, do whatever you want to, but I'm just telling you, in five minutes, we're getting ready to come out here and, and the uh, football team's going to practice on the practice field where we're supposed to. And it was a real issue. And it wasn't the guy's fault. I mean, he just figured it, you know, we wouldn't be coming over there because it's raining and all. But but uh, it was, I knew right then I had to mend a few fences here. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, but uh, I was thinking, can't even get on the dang field. So, that was the reason that Peyton ripped us that first year. We never had enough practice. Yeah. Well, yeah, that, that's the reason. That's it. <laughs> no, I wasn't. They didn't. <laughs> okay, Lee, I was throwing you a rope. Come on, man. They, they deserved it. You got to meet me halfway, Coach. All right. Uh, speaking of deserve, you folks, you deserve a good meal. I want you all to go to your pie. I know it's Thursday. We always tell you that on Tuesday to order your pizzas, but uh, – uh, we kind of missed that one because it's uh, Thursday afternoon or Thursday evening. Uh, but try this new uh, pie they have, the spicy barbecue pulled pork uh, pizza. This is one of their – they have about seven or eight pizzas you can go in. There's their specialty ones. You walk in, they got a, they got a list on the wall. You can order the Nat, the Ishka, you know, and they have um, the Southern Heat. They have a bunch of different styles. Of course, the whole concept of your pie is to go in and get it uh, custom made. Tell them what crust you want. Tell them what sauce, what cheeses, what toppings. It doesn't matter how many toppings you get. It's the same price. Of course, they just had uh, pie day last week, and there were lines going everywhere for people showing up for the cheap pies on uh, March 14th. But uh, this is a new one. This is their new specialty. It's limited time only. It's spicy. It's savory. Uh, it's a uh, – you've got – Pulled pork, red onions, mozzarella, cilantro, pickled jalapenos, and barbecue sauce together on a pizza. It looks phenomenal. I'm going to have to go to the uh, one in LaGrange and pick one up or swing by the one here in Athens and grab one there. Check out uh, your pie when you get a chance. Of course, they also have breadsticks and salads and sandwiches and stuff like that. You'll absolutely. Oh, and some of them have wings now. You get really good wings at that place. Also, uh, if, you, if you were thinking about opening your own your pie or opening a restaurant or having a home-based business or something like that, reach out to our friends at myperfectfranchise.net. And it's a really simple process. Basically, you call out, you call them or email them and say, hey, this is what I want to do. And they will determine if franchising is right for you and if you're ready to change your life. Uh, once they've talked, uh, they'll take you through the uh, My Perfect Franchise confidential questionnaire, and that helps uh, a lot. Then they start finding the perfect franchise for your lifestyle. Basically, um, how much time do you have? What, how much you, work do you want to put into it? What do you want to do? You know, and then they will help match you with the perfect franchise. They introduce you, see if it works out. Then the real fun starts. And if it does, like a lot of our subscribers at UGSports.com, they start a new business and they are signing the front of the checks to their employees. You know, instead of signing the back, working for somebody else. So check out MyPerfectFranchise.net. Andy Ludecki, he can get you squared away. Let's get to some questions from UGAsports.com. Members, UGA alum 95 wants to talk about offensive line for a moment. It says, Coach, do you see Matt Luke hurting Georgia in recruiting over at Clemson? And then also, any chance that Sam Pittman ever comes back to Georgia since his days at Arkansas could be numbered? He already has Bobby Petrino looking over his shoulder. Yeah, I would never think if they did make a change that they would put Petrino in charge, I mean, after everything that happened there. But, you know, I never thought they'd hire him back either. But, you know, Coach Luke's a good good coach and good recruiter. Uh, he, he'll get his share, and Clemson's going to always recruit on a high level. And uh, certainly there's a big battle out there between George and Clemson for David Sanders, that top offensive lineman that you read about on rival site that all our guys jed and those guys do good articles on uh so uh, but in the end result um uh, it makes a little difference maybe but you know the overall program and the stability of the head coach and all that are, are the biggest things and uh getting the guy and, and and the guys you're putting in the pros that's one thing right now man we you just look at I think this will be like four out of the last five years we've had a first round draft choice in the O line after Mims comes after and you had Jones and then and then Thomas, those guys. I mean a lot of number one and we went like twelve or fourteen years without even having a guy in the first three rounds. Yeah. 
Well, I don't, I don't think George is looking for an offensive line coach anytime soon. I think Stacy's doing a good job, but a sneaky thing this off season because every coach keeps a list of just, you know, if you need it, just in case Eddie Gordon getting the NFL experience with oh, the Green Bay Packers. Eddie be somebody we would hire down the road, I think. So yeah, that's if, not a head coach somewhere. Uh, Matt Luke is a problem when it comes to David Sanders. David Sanders is one of those guys out – on our next recruiting show, I'm going to ask our guys, who is the must-get player in this upcoming class? You love David Sanders. You love Justice Terry. You love oh, Elijah. Juju. Yeah, you it's got be Juju. Juju. You, let, let, let me get through the damn list before you jump <laughs> in. You know? And uh, We've already gone through three more than what the first number one must be. You are quarterback – Conscious. You are quarterback heavy. We first time we had you on the show, we asked you the same question: Who are the top three guys Georgia needs to get? And you said Justin Fields, Justin Fields, Justin Fields. Right. <laughs> so it's now Juju Lewis. And to be to be fair, you are. But uh, when you watch Matt Luke, man, it's like Matt. If you take, if you wind up getting David Sanders, we are not friends anymore because that is a great kid. I love him a lot. Uh, would love to cover him here at the University of Georgia as a. Uh, Kind of like Jared Wilson. If, if you get a chance, folks, go back and watch the Jared Wilson interview. That is a fun kid to talk to. He's he's hilarious. He's engaging. And apparently he's a physical freak. So uh, so is David Sanders. And if uh, Matt Luke gets him at Clemson, then uh, Georgia needs to score 70 on him this uh, end the opening season. Pair of questions here from Pop Tab 4599. First one, which starters or second teamers from last year do you think have taken the biggest step up going into this 2024 season? I'd say Oscar Delp, uh, just because of what's going to be expected of him. But I really think he's very capable of making that big step. I uh, already mentioned Wilson. I think Micah Morris is going to be right there in the offensive line, too. Uh, he was a second team guy. Ian Fairchild will be banging it away. Uh, and then uh, on defense, uh, some of those corners, I think, uh, whether it's Harris or Everett or uh, Humphreys, one of those three, you're going to have to really surface pretty quick. And then you got some good guys coming up Robinson and that kid from Indiana. So, and then uh, D line, you know, uh, both Stackhouse and uh, Brunson, are go- Brunson are going to have to step it up, I think, coming back like they did. Another one in the secondary, I, I think Aguero's spot looks like one that's going to emerge here for him. He's definitely, to me, I don't know that he's going to be an upgrade over Taiki, but he's going to be close to being the same kind of player. And there's a guy right there that just really benefited from playing at Georgia, learning how to play man coverage being a big phenom on special teams, increasing his quickness, overcoming an injury like he had. Uh, just can't say enough about the way Tyke developed here at Georgia. Just outstanding. I mean, he was all-conference, and why would he leave and come to Georgia? You answered the question right there. He he got better. There's no question about it. Uh, the only guy I'd add to that list is – I mentioned Jamal Jarrett looking really good, you know, having lost some weight, but Jordan Hall. I think he oh, can be the guy. Jordan Hall is a real deal. And the second question from Pop Tab, and I, I really like this one. Coach, which former player, regardless of what team you coached, are you most proud of of the man that he has become? And there was the caveat that you can't say Todd. Huh. Well, I mentioned Todd today. Todd's birthday, 52 years old. Oh, happy birthday, Todd. And uh, happy for him. I remember – the day he was born, uh, we were having spring practice at Florida State, and I could uh, – my coach said, you can go back, but you need to be back tomorrow. So I so I didn't even see him until he was like eight eight days old. But uh, but he was definitely the best quarterback in our family. He, he was better than me. Uh, not much, but he was better. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so uh, as far as who I'm most proud of, good Lord. I mean, I'm proud of all of them. And, uh, just had a devastating situation last week when Doug Davis passed away, one of my deep snappers here, uh, heart attack, 47 years old. It was doing a great job in 
business and as a family member, father and everything. And uh, but there's a lot of them that I can't. I mean, that's a really tough question. I mean, it's like asking which one of your kids you love the most or something. I mean, I don't know how I can answer that about the most. That's an easy question. Yeah, but uh, I only have one. I like, I like to see some of the things these guys are doing outside of football, you know, like David Pollock, all the things he does, the raising money for the foundation, the champ. Same thing. Keith Jackson's got a nonprofit there in the Little Rock that he does. It's just outstanding for all the underprivileged kids. Impressive. Well, I got to imagine some of your former players or some of these high school coaches come up in here right now, aren't they? Yeah, I mean, I saw Priscilla Miller today uh, out there uh, and a couple others, and I'll go over there tomorrow. I, I like to go more the second day when they're not – Georgia not practicing because I like to watch practice. I mean, you get over there shooting the breeze, you miss it. So, uh, But they'll be over there, and uh, Kirby's brought two coaches in, which I applaud him, the fact that he gets a coach like uh, Willie Fritz is coming in here from uh, – who was at Tulane, but now at Houston, but runs the offense a little bit different than maybe what Georgia runs and gives the coaches, the high school coaches, a chance to see some things and talk to them about some things that are really more what they do in high school. And, and also uh, the guy from up at Liberty who is, you know, they won 14 games last year, 13 games. They had a great year and uh, he runs a, more of an option attack and he'll come in here and, talk to them tomorrow too. I always like to listen to those guys lecture. Are there some other coaches around the country doing unique things on offense that have kind of caught your eye in recent years that you would just want to sit down and talk ball with them? You know, I think copycat world, you know, a lot of people do pretty much the same stuff, but uh, I'm pretty much beyond the X and O's anymore. I mean, I, I don't get off on that like I used to, but as far as being a, Guy that wants to sit down, hey, show me your best formation. I mean, I'd whole lot rather say, hey, where can we go eat or something like that. <laughs> uh, well, and sometimes that part of coaching is overrated anyway because I'm you have being, to have the best players. I'm not, I'm not being, uh, I mean, certainly, I, if guy wants to ask me about something and ask me of my opinion or wants me to say what do we do, I, I'll do that. But, you know, I don't. I've pretty much seen about about anything you ever drawn up. I've pretty much seen it, I think. Well, I was more I, I asked because I'm curious who's just kind of making waves out there. Willie Fritz has always run things a bit differently, but he, yeah, he's he, been great yeah. everywhere he's gone. Yeah, I think uh I think certainly uh there's a lot of different innovators around there and some of them aren't on the level of division one. You look at some of the things Montana, Montana State, Houston Baptist, uh Carnate worlds, those people. I mean, they got some really um, South uh, North Dakota and South Dakota State. I mean, they got some really good schemes they run, and I like to watch some of those one double A games. And that is, Jamie Chadwell is the guy that's over there now. Right. Should be speaking here this weekend. This that's a big one. Uh, we got a question that came in on YouTube, and uh, shout out to Jeremy Longo. We're talking about former players who like what they're doing. Jeremy Longo let us know that if uh, we ever needed an ice cold yingling flight for the next show, just to, to tell him. Hey, he was always on top of that. We appreciate it. We appreciate him. Uh, I, I saw a guy uh, a couple of days ago and asked me when, when we're going to do the next watch along show. I said, well, not any games unless you want me to do the, the tennis matches or something. We we're not having any games to September, but uh, he, so, but it was nice of him to mention it. Yeah, uh, I appreciate uh, Yingling and uh, Jeremy Longo sponsoring our watch along show. It was very nice of him to do that. He's a good one. A uh, question from James Carraway, coach: uh, Who's been standing out as leaders early on this spring? We mentioned that uh, Kirby Smart signaled out Travis or uh, Tra Trevor Etienne right off the bat. Of course, Carson Beck. But uh, have you heard anything along those lines? No, I just think in the O line, you got a guy like uh, you got two linemen that came back, like Truss and uh, and. Uh, the, the fact that he, you know, had a chance to go. And then Rattledge. and then Rattledge, both of those guys are definitely uh, leaders by example just because they've been around. They got those young linemen watching them. And uh, I mentioned before having Warren Erickson out there as a uh, yeah. as a uh, graduate yeah. 
it's going to help them and uh, give them more reps and stuff. But uh, and then defense, uh, all those guys on defense are, uh, you know, Michael Williams is kind of a quiet leader, but everybody respects the way he works and the way he does things. And uh, I think uh, certainly uh, any one of those linebackers is capable of that too because of their you know, they're calling the plays and everything. People look up to him. Yeah, Smile Monday was doing the same thing. He's out for spring, but he's coaching him up. And I mean, Dane, you pointed out last week that we actually got to talk to him despite the fact that he was out. That's kind of rare. So Kirby obviously thinks big of him. He's coaching him up. Uh, Nazir Stackhouse, I'd also put on that leader group. And Malachi Starks, definitely. Uh, yeah, I mean, I had not seen him. I don't know what Starks is doing. The, uh, when you were out there, was he dressed out? I didn't see him. Sorry with me if he doesn't dress till the day before Clemson. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, in terms of age, it's Brett Thorson, right? <laughs> <laughs> I saw him today. He's got a mullet. Yes. That fits. That tracks. It does. And, uh, the, him and Tate Rowlett do that show together, right? Yeah, I was about so. to say, it, it's, it's like mo- mono. You know, it's contagious. You go on uh, Tate Australian. Rowlett's show, all of a sudden you got uh, long hair in the back. Australian mullet. I wonder if they have a different name for it down there. Boomerang. <laughs> Probably spider hider. That's all the time we have for questions. We'll have some more uh, for future shows. And it sounds like maybe Tuesday night next week, we'll get our ducks in a row and let people know. Yeah, yeah. let's do it. Let's do it. But I uh, appreciate everybody being flexible. But I do think it's good to not try to compete with, you know, the main man and then uh, – you know, we had a basketball game on Tuesday night too, so yeah. this worked out good. Hope everybody enjoyed it. And baseball game that day too, right? It was a busy day. Yeah, I mean, a lot of things going on. We got tennis this weekend, Friday, Friday and Sunday. Hope we can get back on. Yeah, we played tough schedule. I mean, those teams. Yeah, tend brutal. To, man, I tell you, if I'd have played back, if I'd have had to play like these guys do, I'd have probably quit. Uh, <laughs> I just can't believe how hard they hit the dang ball. And uh, it's just unreal. And the women sent us two out there. They, they just pound it. Unreal. Yeah. It's rough. Uh, Georgia faces Wake Forest 4 o'clock Sunday. I hope everybody tunes into that. And hopefully they win that one too. And hey, it, it's been a long time since we were able to tweet out the fact that Georgia had won a postseason game. I know people wanted them to be in the tournament and, and they're, on, they're, not, they're, they're not. They're in the NIT. But hell, there were years they weren't even the NIT wasn't even an option. So it is a step forward. Yeah, they win two games again. That's that's all good for them. So, uh, for so stay tuned, folks. We will or stay tuned to that Sunday. Keep an eye on them. Try to pull your dogs through. Uh, give them all your best wishes and hopes, and maybe they can advance even in that one. Every game means it'll be a little bit better next year. Anyway, that's all the time we have for this week's show. We will talk to you next week. Take care.